In the last episode, BTR number 21, we had a close look inside this awesome vintage original 1969 Fender Twin Reverb Silverface Drip Edge. Yet, we didn't cover a very important subject, its speakers. That's just what we are doing right now. Fender amplifiers came with different speaker alternatives. In fact, the speakers were made by external third-party companies and licensed to Fender as original parts. The original equipment manufacturer or OEM speakers found in vintage Fender amplifiers over the years were essentially made by five different companies Oxford, CTS, Utah, Janssen and JBL. You can find any of those speakers inside a vintage Fender amplifier as original stock factory parts. The EIA, Electronic Industries Alliance, assigned an identification code to each of those manufacturers. Oxford speakers carried a 465 identification code. CTS stands for Chicago Telephone Supply and had a 137 EIA code. This is a model from the 70s. Contrary to what you may think, Utah speakers were manufactured in Indiana and had a 328 identification code. The 220 code designated the Jensen speakers. In 1966, Fender introduced the JBL speakers as an upgrade option. They were identified by the 73 code. The amps ordered with the JBL speakers from the factory had a considerably higher price and often even received a JBL logo badge on the grill cloth. Of course, through the years, players developed their own preferences. The JBL D120F is a sturdy, powerful and efficient 12 inches speaker. It evolved over a model made for hi-fi audio and was originally intended to suit the crisp tone of a surf guitar legend Dick Dale. These speakers are popular for country music, especially among pedal steel players, but actually are not what most guitarists favor. In many cases, they tend to sound too bright and clean. CTS, Oxford and Utah are not really highly regarded, with the later ceramic Oxfords getting the unfair nickname of Oxfords, and the Utahs even getting worse reputation. Basically, Jensen made the most revered speakers found in old vintage Fender amplifiers. With their smooth and even frequency response, they are great with the distortion and pinpoint the tone many players are after. Basically, they play a big part in defining the classic Fender amp sound. Back to the question closing the last episode. What speakers did I find in this nice 1969 twin? Drum roll. They're Utahs. This means that now I'm so much tainted to upgrade the speakers of my twin reverb with a pair of Jensen's. The Jensen Speakers Company was founded in Chicago in 1927 by the Danish-American engineer Peter Jensen. He had co-invented the first modern loudspeaker in 1915 and created other important innovations, such as the first PA system. He is even considered the first DJ. Starting from the 40s, the Jensen musical instrument speakers were featured in the amplifiers of many major companies, such as Ampeg, Gibson, Supra, Magnatone and Fender. In 1967, the CBS management stopped sourcing Jensen speakers for Fender amplifiers. 
This entailed the decline of the original Janssen company, which eventually stopped the production in 1972. The Janssen speakers became much sought after in the vintage market. This, in 1996, led the Italian company Sica Altoparlanti, located in Senigallia, to revive the Janssen brand. The new Janssen ratios, made in Italy, are philologically accurate recreations. They are made after rigorous studies to the same exact specifications as the vintage speakers. This was not an easy task, since the precious technical information kept in the original archives went lost through the years. Therefore, a reverse engineering process was carried out to keep design and materials as close as possible to the original speakers made in Chicago. The gratifying result is that Fender, for about 20 years now, started again to adopt the Jensen speakers in their top-shelf amplifiers. Many speakers carry date codes on the frame to identify the manufacturing date. In this six-digit code, after the company's specific EIA code, which in the case of Jensen is 220, we find the last digit of the year and the two digits of the week of manufacture. For instance, the code on this ceramic speaker would apply to a speaker manufactured either in 1953 or 1963, on the 45th week of that year. Nevertheless, ceramic magnets were introduced in 1960. In the 50s, only alnico magnets were produced, so this ceramic speaker definitely dates back to November 1963. The same code is still in use today, it is now a seven-digit code with two digits indicating the year more clearly. So, do I need to dive into the troublesome vintage market to find a couple of original Jensen's, or can I trust the contemporary ratios? Years ago I had a fabulous vintage original Jensen pin 12 and speaker from the 50s. When I came across its ratio, I could definitely recognize the character of the original speaker. So I decided to test in my twin a couple of brand new Jensen C12N ratios. <music> To shed some light on speakers' model names as C12N, the first letter denotes the magnet type, P for Alnico, in use from the 40s, and C stands for ceramic. The following number indicates the diameter of the speaker, in this case 12. The final letter designates the magnet weight in direct proportion to the power rating. R is about 25 watts, Q 35 watts and 50 watts, and K 100 watts. The Jensen C12 Ants were the speakers that typically came fitted in the vintage blackface twin reverbs from the 60s, so they are a historically correct upgrade and ideal match with the classic twins circuit. The current 65 twin reverb ratio comes with the C12K speakers with top power rating for even more headroom and volume, but actually a highly efficient speaker in a powerful amplifier can prove to be a double-edged sword, as we'll see in the next episode. But wait, before proceeding with changing the speakers in my 1969 Twin Reverb, we must recognize that the vintage original Utah speakers, as we heard them in the last episode, didn't sound bad at all, did they? <laughs> In spite of their bad reputation, we should admit that they had a rather creamy and warm tone. 
So, when you're planning to upgrade your gear before taking chances of wasting money, time with useless and unsuccessful modifications, I think that first you always have to ask yourself what improvements are you after tone-wise? What am I expecting from the new speakers? Actually, the vintage Utes still leave room for improvement. In particular, they have a slight tendency to flap with strong bass signals. Also, from a vintage twin reverb, I could expect more clean headroom and a little more power and volume, which a more efficient speaker should give. To do a scientific test, we have to keep as consistent as possible the input signal. Therefore, I decided to record a couple of loops with different tonal characteristics to be reproduced through the different speakers. Let's move to Enrico Tozzini's rehearsing room to hear from the speakers. That's what we did. We started with recording the Utahs. Before moving the amplifier, we marked its exact position with masking tape. We installed the pair of Janssens and proceeded with the recording. <laughs> As always, Enrico did a great job. He preserved the original wiring and solder joint of the Utahs. This allows to revert the twin to its unmolested original vintage configuration anytime. Enough with words. Bullseye, I heard exactly what I was hoping to find out. The Jensens have a great balance. They have firmer bottom hand, more headroom and definition while still having smooth frequency response and an aggressive snarl with distortion. Furthermore, their performance will considerably improve in the near future. In fact, when comparing as we just did, old or vintage speakers with brand new factory fresh units, we must take into account the break-in or burn-in factor, which causes a dramatic change in frequency response over time. When we open a new book in the shop, it usually is still rather stiff, and keeping it wide open while turning the pages may result awkward. After we read it all through, it will likely be quite more flexible the same happens with the speakers. After the break-in period, our speakers will be likely gaining dynamics and proper response, 
losing a certain harsh edge and sounding warmer and more open, especially on the bottom end. This argument may favor vintage speakers, but you won't find two identical vintage speakers that came out of the factory in the same day that through the years will sound exactly the same. In fact, another key factor is the aging. To quote Ignazio Vagnone of Jensen Speakers, who I warmly thank for his kind collaboration, the same old speaker played for years in an apartment's climate environment at bedroom levels would have sounded very different if it had been abused for five days a week in a dance hall on the seafront. This argument may favor the ratios. As always, the best way to go is to consider every possible alternative before spending money to find the solution that really fits your needs. In the next BTR episode, still, we will be speaking of speakers, as we have some more very interesting information to share and discuss on this topic. Let me know your impressions on the speaker's comparison test in the comments below or in our Facebook group. Please take a moment to subscribe to the BTR channel and hit the bell so that you will get a notification as soon as any new content is out.